Okay, so this unit has a lot of things in it that all relate very closely together and kind of overlap, and they also overlap a little with Byzantine and also a little with uh, the late Roman Empire and also with the Islamic art world. So everything gets a little wild at this point in the semester. So this is just going to be an introduction to early medieval Europe. Um, between 500 and 1000 was a formative period in the world of art in Europe. Um, many of the patrons of art are monks. So we have, with uh, the rise of Christianity, we have all these monasteries that have monks in them and abbeys with nuns. Um, and the monks are, they, they don't only bring the gospel to the non-Christian and largely illiterate people of the Northwestern portion of the former Roman Empire, they also bring with them culture and books. Um, we'll get to books, but first let's break down the history a little bit. Okay, so uh, what do you know about medieval Europe or the Middle Ages? Usually when I ask this in my seated class, um, people say things like castles and knights and jousting and things like that, and you are not wrong. Uh, there's also other things going on. But let's just get right into it and, and see what we've got. All right, so early medieval art in Western Europe has three really big influences and a lot of other influences, but a lot of, of the influence comes from these three things. The classical heritage of Rome. Because remember, Rome ruled like all of Europe for a while, so that's very influential even after the fall of Rome. Non-Romans that lived north of the Alps are very influential. And then this new religion called Christianity is super influential. Um, Romans thought of everyone outside of the borders of their empire as barbarians. So keep that in mind. That's why we have a separation between um, the Romans and the non-Romans. So the Romans thought that the Huns, Vandals, Franks, Goths, Visigoths, Vikings, Morovians, Celts, Ostrogoths, Anglo-Saxons, Hiberno-Saxons, Lombards, they thought all of those people were barbarians, <laughs> okay? Uh, they weren't, they all had their own culture and lots of things going on. Uh, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about some of these people. Um, and one of the groups that we're going to look at are the Morovian and Anglo-Saxon people. From them we have the great literary work Beowulf, we have bejeweled personal items, we have interlaced patterns, we have intertwined animal patterns, and we have cloisonne. The Hiberno-Saxon and Carolingian uh, peoples, we have Christian missionaries, which are very influential in spreading not just um, their Christian religion, but also cultural heritage and information. We have Charlemagne, who's another one of those guys whose name you've maybe heard of because he's pretty famous, does a lot of conquering or uniting, right? Uh, we have uh, the development of the Twin Tower Westwork on Basilican churches uh, under the Carolingians, which is very influential in the way that churches are gonna look kind of for the rest of Western art history. Um, then we have the Atonians. Not the Ottomans, those are different. The Ottoman people are the uh, Turkish people who take over after Byzantine falls. This is the Atonians, different group of people, similar name. Um, illuminated manuscripts that are inspired by late Byzantine sources. Um, we have ivory makes a big comeback. They love carving things out of ivory. Bishop Bernward adorned St. Michael's at Hildesheim with bronze doors and a freestanding bronze column covered in figure reliefs, which um, makes bronze a, a more popular kind of medium again. Alternate support systems in naves and adding galleries to the basilica plan and churches. So basilica plan kind of wins out over the central plan that we talked about during the Byzantine and becomes basically the way most churches are designed from here on out in Europe. Okay, so that was your quick little intro and kind of overview and next we will talk about the Rovingans and the Anglo-Saxons.